it sometimes happens in worlds such as ours that things go missing. And it sometimes happens that the things that are missing are found by something else. Wrath drifted into islands of new terrain, a realm of novelty. Cassandra was something missing. She didn't mean to become missing, of course. She understood that some people would enjoy getting something close to lost. It just wasn't her thing. But the force nearby had been so inviting and seemed oh so interesting. What was there to do but march directly into it? Then time hustled ever onward as a good time will do, and it was underneath the gently smiling moon in a thicket of slate-colored conifers that Cassandra had found herself standing. With a drop of adamant and a puddle of determination, she decided she would simply have to unlost herself, and so she trudged, unbeknownst to her, for she thought she would soon be outside, directly into the spotlight on the stage of interesting. After a while, Cassandra became hungry. It was difficult to determine exactly how long she had been in the forest, but the rumbling of her stomach proved to be a semi-reliable timer. Too long, too long, too long. Passing through, she saw a cluster of lovely-looking red-capped mushrooms, decadent and plump, with dollops of creamy white spots speckling the top. She plucked them from the earth and held them delicately in her hand, thinking that she would consider the possible dangers and potential benefits while she walked. It was a good plan, but not an effective one. And her gastronomical alarm clock continued to ring out, too long, too long, too long. She clutched the mushrooms desperately, held them to her lips, and took a luscious, luxurious bite. She fell, and she slept. The first time she saw the creature, she was surprised simultaneously by two things. First, by how immediately and soundly the mushroom had caused her to sleep and second by how similar the creature in front of her had resembled a tall, mushroom-shaped person. It had a long, frilly trunk of a torso with delicate feet, which terminated into countless fibers in place of toes, fine as corn silk and plural as leaves on a tree. All over it was a brilliant, sanguinic scarlet color, and upon its face was a modeling of tiny white spots. The hair of the creature shone with wispy mycelium fibers as well, and on the very tippy top of the head, was a brilliant and stately crown of miniature amanitas. Cassandra witnessed the creature with awe as she lifted herself from the ground. It noticed her notice itself, and then met her gaze with familiar human eyes. The two stared at each other, and as Cassandra thought that there could never be anything more magnificent than this moment, the creature proved her wrong and spoke. Ah, it seems our guest is awake. There were now several iterations of the character, apparating like reflections in a house of mirrors, only moving in time differently, wilder, calmer, faster, slower, to different destinations and with different purpose. Cassandra realized these iterations were indeed other different mushroom creatures, and they were all moving closer to get a better look at her. Cassandra began to take in her surroundings and noticed a curious arrangement of various items, perhaps knickknacks that the creatures had collected by other wayward travelers. The tree just behind her was adorned with a large ornate mirror. Had that been there before? By now she was surrounded by the creatures, who formed a loose circle around her. Amid interested, cacophonous chatter, several bleats of excitement, and a general clamor of chaos, Cassandra raised her voice and said, Please excuse me, but I am lost. Will you tell me how I can get home? A chorus of laughter cascaded through the trees, howls and chortles interchanged with guffaws and grunts. As the reverberations decayed, the one who spoke said, Silly one, you cannot go home now. You have already begun to change. Look. And it pointed one slender finger towards Cassandra's head. The girl looked into the mirror and was mortified to see that right on the crown of her head, a plurality of Amanita mushrooms had begun to sprout. Bawling with fear, she clutched handfuls of mushrooms and began to pull. I wouldn't do that if I were you, said the one who spoke. It'll hurt quite a lot. Please, Cassandra cried, help me. I cannot remain here. I cannot become one of you, though it would thrill me. Where I am from, I am dependent upon, and I must return to those who need me. Whyever this is happening, you must stop it. The one who spoke looked expressionless as it replied, It can be done, but I do not wish to do it. It is quite seldom that we get a visitor, let alone one who eats the fruit of the life that runs through this forest. You have taken of the mushroom, and now the forest takes of you. This was unacceptable. Cassandra would continue her protests until finally, the one who spoke would interrupt her and say, fine, I will restore your body to the way it came, but first you must prove that you are worthy of those who depend upon you. 
I do it for the sake of those who do. There will be three challenges. The first is this. You must be curious. Tell me, why does the rooster crow in the morning? Cassandra thought deeply about what she would say for a short period of time. How could she demonstrate her curiosity by answering this question? Well, she could think of one way. I wonder why, she replied. The one who spoke grinned and bowed. That is an acceptable answer. The second challenge is this. You must be patient. Hold your breath for 15 minutes. It proved to be a difficult one at first. Cassandra breathed the lush forest air deeply. She stretched her lungs as full and wide as she could. She even practiced several different stretching exercises. She did all these things and more, but the longest she could hold her breath was only barely over three minutes. Several attempts later, she risked a horrifying glance into the mirror. The transformation was progressing. All over, her skin had turned cheery and horrifyingly scarlet, and her face had become bespeckled with white spots. Oh no, she fretted, this is awful! I only have a little more time before my legs turn into roots, and I'm stuck here for good! She allowed herself only a moment of panic, and afterward, she had an idea. Reaching into her pocket, she pulled out a handkerchief that she was able to fold through the hollow of her hand into a pocket. Then, holding the entrance of the pocketed cloth up to her lips, she blew out into the cloth and then pinched off the opening of the pocket. Then, she held her pocket full of breath for 15 minutes. The one who spoke was enthralled as joy spread widely across their face. Excellent, very excellent human. Your third challenge is this. You must be strong. It walked to a stone statue previously outside of the world entirely, somehow seeming to have been snapped into being. It looked heavy, massive, and imposing. The one who spoke laid a slender hand on the statue and said, Move this! Cassandra had come too far to give up, but this challenge seemed insurmountable. She had never been much more than small, and this statue was enormous. But after some thoughtfulness, Cassandra realized there was a different kind of strength. She approached the statue and said, Statue, thank you for your solidness and resolution. I appreciate you, and I'm glad that, of all the worlds within which you could have possibly existed, it is this world that has you. With that, she wrapped her tiny arms around the statue and, rather than pushing, she gave it a hug. The statue was so moved by this sincere display of affection that it began to weep and shuffled aside. The gallery of mushroom kin erupted into applause and whoops of excitement. The one who spoke looked impressed and beaming, but also had a sober darkness of resolution and acceptance. You have bested my challenge. You are worthy of those who depend upon you, and you have curiosity, patience, and strength. You may return, it said with a smile. Much later, just on the outermost delineation of forest, Cassandra awoke to sunbeams warming the lids of her eyes. Her anxious hands and eyeballs reached a relieved accord as they conferred about the rest of her body. There were no mycelium strings, there was no wrinkly red skin, and there were no spots. And as she stepped gently through the field back to her house, although she would not yet notice them, she left behind tiny clusters of amanitas growing in the damp hollows of her footsteps.